Yayo Kusama is considered by the art world to be the most significant living female artist, and she's certainly the most expensive. But what's more important from my perspective is that she's a disabled artist. Although she is explicit about the connections between her disability and her art, the art world is more circumspect. They may think it's out of respect, but actually it's a bias, unconscious or otherwise, to minimise the fact that a disabled person could also be the world's most important living female artist. She's a pioneer first and foremost, both as a female and Asian artist, who in the 1960s transgressed painting, sculpture and performance. She was born in 1929 into a traditional and wealthy family who frowned on her desire to be an artist. As a young girl, Kusama experienced hallucinations, which she described as flashes of light, auras or dense fields of dots. Those early experiences played a pivotal role in shaping her artistic vision. Fed up with the constricted art scene in Japan, she moved to New York in her 20s and quickly became enmeshed in the male-dominated art world. Her ideas were innovative and quickly suborned by her more successful male contemporaries like Klaus Oldenburg and Andy Warhol. Disillusioned and broke, she returned to Japan to vanish, albeit briefly, into obscurity. In 1977, she checked herself into the Siwa Institute for Mental Health and has lived there ever since. She's best known for her infinity rooms that attract thousands of visitors and galleries love them because of the increased revenue and the fact they drag in people who might otherwise not be in the slightest bit interested in art. I went to the Tate Modern to see two of these rooms that have been given to the gallery. Essentially, these are very simple installations uncomplicated and effective. Kusama made her first one in 1965 during her New York days. She underlines the importance of the role the viewer plays in her rooms. It is the viewer who changes the shape of the work by constantly changing his position relative to it. Kusama grapples with a depersonalization disorder, a condition that leads to a profound sense of disconnection from oneself and reality. She describes it as feeling like she is in the world, but not of the world. Two minutes, which is how long you get in the rooms, isn't nearly enough time for someone to relate to the kind of disassociation Kusama experiences. I think 20 minutes in the room would be a more appropriate amount of time to truly start to lose oneself in the environment. For those of us who've experienced the feeling of not existing, these rooms would be a comforting safe space, but it might become rather uncomfortable for many people. These simple fairground attraction installations work on different levels, and what you take from them depends on your approach to them. On one level, they are indeed a fairground hall of mirrors, a novel trinket of experience. And on another, more profound level, they link the viewer to their own insignificance in the face of the infinite, which we as humans continually fail to acknowledge, for doing so would lead to psychic impotence. These are not so much liminal spaces as deliberate and palpable evocations of the unseen. Kusama's journey as an artist living with mental illness has yielded a profound body of work that captivates audiences worldwide. Her ability to transform her illness into a visual representation of self-obliteration and beauty is testament to the transformative power of disability. Mad artists, and I use the term as a compliment, from William Blake to Kusama have significantly shaped our cultural landscape. But there is something unpalatable 
in the remorseless merchandising and branding of Kusama, which is not unlike Frida Kahlo, and it's used, perhaps not consciously, to silence the fact that disability is fundamental to their art. We are so used to seeing Renoir on a chocolate box or Frida Kahlo as a Barbie doll or on a pair of socks. We miss the insidious nature of commercialization as it reduces art to a commodity. Any radical artistic statement is expunged and we're left with what? A right-wing prime minister wearing a Frida bracelet? A 200 pound cushion made in a sweatshop in China? A tea towel? This, and the fact viewers only get two minutes inside the room, feels disingenuous. I realise these are small rooms with a huge number of people trying to visit, so time has to be limited. But two minutes isn't long enough to do anything other than take a selfie. The solution? Well, I'm going to build my own infinity room in my back garden. So I visit to my local DIY store to get a load of square mirror tiles, some MDF panels and some timber and some colour changing lights and I'll be floating in obliteration Kusama style before you can say that will be £10 please. While there are many questions about the way the Kusama Foundation goes about marketing and exploiting her art and about what agency she may or may not have in all that, Kusama's work demonstrates art's capacity to give meaning to pain. Chaos made ordered, stigma made beautiful, isolation made communal. Kusama forges important work from the fire of her mind's affliction. <laughs>